Good afternoon, everybody. Well, for that matter, good evening as well, depending on which side of the world you find yourself. If you are in the USA, it's afternoon. If you are in Africa, it's most likely evening. Um, I know a number of people are still logging in. And so uh, let me go ahead and spend the next few minutes laying out the basis for our conversation. Well, uh, welcome to Cornell Alliance for Science live webinar sessions today, Wednesday, the 17th of March, 2021. We have both, um, you know, a global audience and a global panel of discussants with some panelists joining us from Ghana, others from Rwanda, uh, also from the USA. Uh, we'll veer into the details of the conversation on agroecology in a while, but first of all, let me tell you briefly about Cornell Alliance for Science. Cornell Alliance for Science is a global science communications initiative comprised of organizations committed, uh, you know, to improving access to technological innovations that can support environmental sustainability and also improve livelihoods. And uh, well, the work of Alliance for Science seeks to enhance food security, improve environmental sustainability, and also raise the quality of life globally. You can read more about Cornell Alliance for Science when you log on to the website, www.allianceforscience.cornell.edu. You can also follow AFS on Twitter at Science Ally. That's S-C-I-E-N-C-E-A-L-L-Y. Uh, you can also follow Alliance for Science on Facebook at Science Ally. And then on Instagram, you can as well follow uh, Alliance for Science at Science Ally. Um, as the conversation unfolds, you can share your questions in the chat and they will be read to the panelists and would we'll get their responses to those who will dedicate the last 30 minutes of the conversation to uh, the question and answer session from you, the members of the audience. And um, Alliance for Science Life actually seeks to put into context major scientific and agricultural issues. And then we bring the people with a very in-depth knowledge to speak on some of those issues. And today's webinar is under the theme, agroecology in Africa, opportunities, constraints, prospects and limitations. I have five guests today. Two of them are promoters of agroecology. And uh, well, the other panelists are a bit critical of the technology broadly. Let me begin by introducing our panelists to you. First, Professor Irene Ejir. Professor Ejir is an associate professor at the University of Ghana's Agricultural Economics Department. She's an agricultural economist with more than three decades of experience teaching and engaging in research and consultancies. She is currently the lead researcher of two projects that aim at understanding the productivity, the profitability, and the sustainability of organic and conventional farming systems. So her background is really relevant to this conversation we are having today. Professor Ajir, uh, good evening to you and thanks very much for making the time. Good evening, Joseph, and good evening to our listeners and viewers. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. My second panelist, Nasib Mugwanya, is a Ugandan agricultural communication specialist and also a PhD candidate at uh, North Carolina State University's Department of Agriculture and Human Sciences. Prior to his PhD studies, Nasib worked with the National Crops Resources Research Institute in Uganda where he spent most of the time in educational and outreach engagements among smallholder farmers. He is the author of a paper that has become very popular after it was published in June, and he titles it, Why Agroecology is a Dead End for Africa. He'll be telling us more about that in a while. Nasib, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, thanks, Joseph, and I'm glad to be here. My third guest is Mr. Bernard Guri. He's executive director of the Center for Indigenous Knowledge and Organizational Development in Ghana. Uh, the organization is called SICOD, and SICOD actually works to develop various methodologies which are aimed at strengthening local communities to demand for development, particularly the poor and the vulnerable. Uh, he's a doctoral student at the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Cape Coast in Ghana and he's a development practitioner with special interest in indigenous knowledge and institutional development. He's also the chairman of the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa, which is based in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, Mr. Guri, thanks very much for joining us 
and uh, we are grateful that you made the time for us to have this conversation. Looks like Mr. Guri's microphone is muted. Thanks very much for joining us, Mr. Guri. Yeah, okay. So thank you, Joseph. Yeah, pleased to be here yeah, to have this audience. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Pacific uh, Nishimaya is a young farmer and agricultural entrepreneur from Rwanda. He founded and currently runs Real Green Gold Limited, which is a social enterprise which does farming of tropical fruits and vegetables and also um, smallholder farmers extension services. He's a member of the Young Professionals for Agricultural Development, YPAD, and he's also a founding member of Rwanda's um, Youth in Agribusiness Forum. He's also the author of a popular paper which he titled Saving Africa's Agroecological Food Baskets and the Agroecology Movement. Pacific, thanks very much for joining us too. The pressure is mine. Great. And, and the final panelist um, is a man that I have so much respect for. Dr. Charles Nyaba is a farmer in Ghana. He is also the head of programs and advocacy at the Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana. Uh, he leads various efforts at the association to bring improvements in the lives of ordinary farmers and it's a regular feature on radio and TV advocating for better policies for the agricultural sector broadly. Uh, he holds a PhD in agribusiness from the University of Ghana. Uh, he's been one of the lead voices in the association's work at promoting agroecology in Ghana. Dr. Nyaba, thanks very much for joining us and um, a very good evening to you. Thank you, Opoku. And let me say uh, thank you to all the listeners and the, my colleague panelists. Many thanks, uh, Dr. Nyaba. Um, my name is Joseph Opoku Gaku. I'm an agricultural environment and rural development journalist based in Ghana. Uh, this webinar will discuss, as I indicated, the opportunities, the constraints, the prospects, and the limitations of agroecology in Africa. Uh, it will explore what agroecology is, the ongoing efforts to popularize it in Africa the likely positive and negative impact of its widespread adoption and its intersection with modern agricultural methods among others. Uh, and as you can see, we have quite a rich panel of expertise to properly dissect this particular topic. Um, I'll just quickly get on with the conversation. Uh, well, my panelists have agreed that to each of the questions, they'll keep their responses as brief as possible within three minutes to three and a half minutes so that then we can put as many of the issues as possible. And then at the latter part of the conversation, our audience can also send in their questions. In fact, as and when you have questions, whether you're watching us live on Facebook or you are actually joining us in the webinar room, you can just drop your questions in the chat and then we'll read them out a little later. And additionally, when we get to the final 30 minutes, we would open the room so that then those of you who would want to uh, speak out your questions, you can speak them out and direct them to specific members of the panel to then respond to. Um, Dr. Charles Nyaba, I'll begin with you with a general framing and understanding of agroecology. Um, as a key promoter of agroecology in Ghana and beyond, kindly break it down for us. Uh, what exactly is agroecology? What does it involve? What does it mean to you as a farmer? Dr. Nyaba, you are still muted. And go ahead and unmute and then. Sorry. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Opoku. Um, I think um, it will be unfair if I don't acknowledge my own lecturer and a friend, uh, Prof. Ejeri, uh, who is part of the panel. Now, to, to, to make it short, agroecology for us can be seen from different angles as science, as a movement, and as practice. I say this because if you talk of agroecology, it is simply the study of the ecology. And it is a type of farming practices that recognize biodiversity. Um, there are some misconceptions about agroecology which I would like to correct. Usually when we talk of agroecology, what comes to mind 
by many people is that it doesn't involve the use of machinery. It doesn't involve the use of a, a external inputs. It is necessarily miscropping and that it cannot be scaled. That is not the case. Agroecology, just like conventional farming, can be scaled. Can, we can have 100 hectares of agroecology farm. In that case, we are not looking at the smallholder farmer practices of agroecology where you mix every crop within one acre. So it is the reason why many claim that agroecology cannot feed the world. Now, I say that because before you start your agroecology farm, if the land is bare or is infertile, the first thing we do is try to bring this land back to life by building the biomass. Now, before I even came here, as I've explained that agroecology is important because we are losing our vegetation. We have increasing climate change. The rains and temperatures are becoming too much. And all this agriculture is a contributing factor. So with agroecology, we are able to bring back our tree vegetation. We are able to maintain the, uh, the soil cover. We are able to reduce erosion and then we are able to increase productivity. So we do that in, on small, small scale basis. We are looking at a situation where smallholder farmers are able to produce on the same line with different crop varieties, with limited application of external inputs or disturbance of the soil. If I say this, we don't encourage bringing in external inputs because if you build your biomass, the problem of soil infertility uh, uh, is already addressed, so you don't need to bring in too much fertilizer. Now, with the no-till agriculture, you don't destroy the soil structure. So erosion is limited, leaching is limited. We also include cover cropping to protect the soil cover. So when you do that, when you produce, the residues of the plants go back into the soil because you don't clear and burn. So at the end of the day, the soil still remain fertile, so you don't really need to bring in fertilizer. Now, on large scale basis, we are able to plant the same crop species in, 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 in layers. In this case, we use trees to actually form a boundary where you can still use machinery. So you have maybe 50 acres going with maize, but in between the maize farm and another different crop, you have trees uh, uh, making the cover. So in that case, you still have your three crops on the same land, and then you have your plant species on the same crop. So in that case, we still maintain our vegetation, and then we have our large-scale agroecology. So just like uh, we have smallholder farmers and industrial farmers with agroecology, if you want to do large-scale, there are machineries like rippers and other things that we can use for agroecology without necessarily damaging the soil. So that is just in brief what I can say uh, about agroecology. So, so, so just to be 100% certain, uh, and very briefly, what's the difference between agroecology and modern methods of farming? I know agroecology doesn't encourage um, genetically modified seeds. Agroecology doesn't encourage the use of a lot of um, fertilizers, synthetic fertilizers, as you indicated. Which are some of the things that agroecology doesn't encourage as compared to um, modern farming as we see it? Okay, there is a, a clear distinction between agroecology farming and organic farming. If I say agroecology doesn't encourage the use of inorganic fertilizer, when you are starting mm, to do agroecology farm and the farm is already damaged, it's a dead soil, we call it dead soil. In that case, you want to bring the dead soil back to life. So what we do is we support that soil with minimal, minimal uh, 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 inorganic fertilizer. After that, we then build the soil cover with a cover cropping and mulching. So as time goes, this mulch material are decomposed and support plant growth. So in your subsequent farming, you don't really need to use um, inorganic fertilizer again. Unlike, and apart from the inorganic fertilizer, 
with the agroecology, we don't also encourage the use of heavy machinery like tractors and other things to overturn the soil, destroying the soil structure. So we have reapers and other machinery that we use for planting. So we recognize no-till agriculture as time goes on. Yeah. Now, with conventional farming, you see that every year we continue to till the soil, we use machinery and other things to plow the soil, turning the soil and killing the biodiversity in the soil. We don't actually, uh, with the modern method of farming, it doesn't really encourage uh, um, allowing the soil to rejuvenate through um, the use of cover crops and, 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 and mud material. And then it also encourages the use of synthetic fertilizer, which we think that uh, is not sustainable because at the end of the day, as a small water farmer, you spend all your money in the fertilizer and in the, long la in the long run, if you don't continue using the, applying the fertilizer, your productivity will be low. Now, in, in terms of a genetic modified organism, in uh, the agroecology is talking about the ecology. So we don't put more emphasis on the genetic modified organism or the plant species. But we think that the modern organ, uh, 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 method of farming is encouraging genetic modified organism because of increasing productivity. Because our current land, if you use the indigenous seeds, we are not able to get the yields that we are looking for. But with the genetic modified you need to continue to apply fertilizer. But with agroecology, whether with GMOs or the indigenous seeds, without the fertilizer, you are still going to increase your, your yields. So there is no need for you to spend money trying to bring seeds from elsewhere when you can still use the existing plant varieties to increase your yield. So that's why our emphasis is not on the use of genetically modified organisms. Hmm. Dr. Nyaba, thanks very much. Very detailed explanation and a breakdown of um, agroecology and what it is. Um, I'll, I'll move on to Nasi. Um, in your paper, you say the practices that agroecology promotes are at best a refinement of those that keep African farmers confined to poverty. And this is a paper that I will encourage the uh, all of us who are participating in this conversation to read subsequently. Uh, but Nasi, my, my question is, uh, yourself as well, how does agroecology mean to you? Uh, thanks, uh, Joseph. And uh, picking on from what Charles uh, said, uh, my, uh, there's a science movement and practice side. And my background is agriculture science with a specialization in agriculture extension and education. So i um, attracted and interested to the application of scientific knowledge to agricultural practices. And what agroecology means to me first as a scientist is the application of ecological principles to agriculture or farming. And that's the you know, simpler version I'm using. But the other meaning it has for me as someone who uh, used to interact with farmers is the meaning that incorporates the social, cultural, and political aspects of the food uh, systems or farming systems in which these applications of scientific technologies are being applied. So those are the two meanings to me, the, the, the science version and the non-science version that takes the holistic approach to thinking about uh, food systems. Here I was with my microphone muted, but then uh, Nasi, thanks very much. Um, let me move on to Mr. Bernard Guri. Uh, Mr. Guri, so for you, what is wrong with modern agriculture as we've come to know it, which of course involves the use of heavy machinery, the use of synthetic yeah. pesticides, the use of fertilizers, synthetic pesticides. Um, what is wrong with that kind of modern agriculture, which is mm. motivating groups like the Alliance for Food Sovereignty Africa, SICOD, and organizations mm. like mm. Action, you know, to embark mm. on this whole campaign mm. that discouraging 
modern agriculture and a return to agroecology. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, uh, I acknowledge my colleague, um, Charles, who is here and uh, is my comrade in arms in Ghana, trying to promote the, the, promote the concept of agroecology. And I agree with the definition is given. Um, my side is I work for an organization called the Center for Indigenous Knowledge and Organizational Development. And uh, we come from the point that um, our indigenous knowledge as Africans is very important for our um, the survival of our communities. And that is what has kept them on all that time until education and westernization all came in. In that sense, I look at the definition of agroecology from a cultural perspective. That agriculture has to do with the culture of the people. What do they see as food? It has to do with the knowledge base of the people, you know. Um, and in, our, uh, in that sense, I call it more of traditional ecological knowledge on the basis that our communities already had knowledge about farming. They've used that knowledge to, 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 to keep feeding themselves till today. And therefore, agroecology for me sounds like very similar to traditional ecological knowledge and is the basis. And uh, 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 agroecology is more, you know, working in tune with, with nature, not fighting nature. It's about diversity. And our, our traditional farming system is based on diversity. And for us, food is not just food for eating, it's food also for medicine. And for us, when we're eating food, is about medicine. And that's where diversity is very important in agroecology. And that farmers who grow not only maize or wheat or whatever, but also grow other crops in addition. And biodiversity is the center of everything, is the center of continuity. And any agriculture that doesn't promote that is, is a challenge. And the so-called in, uh, industrial agriculture, that's the challenge it has. It aims just about producing a lot of a particular crop, either maize or wheat or whatever, which, for example, is, is basically for, for, for business, is for exports. But for us, in Africa in particular, food is about, is about our culture. And as a Ghanaian, if I tell you where I come from, you can really determine what food I eat. And for me, as a northerner, for example, teaser is what I eat. If I eat any kind of food and I don't eat teaser, I've been eating food. And therefore, it's important that for people, if they are producing food, they should have the chance, the opportunity to produce what is cultural, culturally acceptable for them. You know, so for me, we see agroecology from that angle. But I also agree with uh, uh, um, Charles on the definition, and this, this has been a, the basis. And so for us in Ghana, I think that our indigenous knowledge is very important. It's a part of agroecology. Thank you. But for for, for well, and for that matter, continent. So what? Um, the estimates are that about six hundred and ninety million people still go hungry across the world on daily basis, it's estimated that about one third of that population is actually in Africa. Um, what's the justification for the kind of food systems that say food is also something that should be related to the culture of the people as against the agricultural intensification methods that seek to say, let's produce far more than enough so that everyone mm -hmm would be able to get food to eat. So where should the priority be? You know, reserving mm -hmm. food as a cultural thing and producing mm -hmm. probably less of it or industrializing it and intensifying mm -hmm. it so that as many people as possible don't go hungry. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think you would believe that although there's industrial agriculture, there is still hunger. And I believe that is because Agriculture has been captured by just a few people who are using technology to produce for the markets. And therefore, if you, you don't have access to the market, you don't have that food that is there. And so there's a lot of food in some parts of the world and there's hunger in other parts. Now, what agri ecological agriculture promotes from a cultural point is that 
let as many people farm. And in Ghana, if you take, for example, 70% of our farmers are the peasants, they're small farmers. And if policy was such that it supported this 70%, they'll be able to feed themselves, number one, and they would definitely have some excess that can go to others. But the policy is more geared at industrial agriculture, where the agricultural budget is more than 50% of it goes to, you know, subsidizing fertilizer, chemical fertilizers, which is, uh, of course, many farmers, ordinary farmers, peasants don't have access to that. But if the policy was geared in such a way that it supported the way people does land fertility, how they manage their soil, and they, they, there's more subsidy even on that, I think we should be able to feed ourselves and even produce excess rather than concentrating production in just 5% of the population using machinery and yet producing for only people who can afford what they're producing. Mr. Benadguri, thanks very much. Um, I'll, I'll get on to Professor Irene J. And I, I would want her to pick it up from where you are just leaving it, that if agroecology is done as well as we expect it, mm -hmm. one way or the other, we should be able to produce enough food to feed the world and beyond. Professor J. Um, are you convinced on that bit that there is a way that agroecology can feed Ghana, where you are from, Africa generally, and the world possibly? Okay. So um, the definitions that have come, um, mine is um, not different because um, food production that makes the best use of, of um, nature's goods and services while not damaging these resources is quite impossible. When we did agroecology farming in 79, when I was in secondary school, and in 87, when I was in the university, agroecology did not accept a lot of the science that Charles and um, others are talking about. So when we said agroecology, then we didn't want to plow a lot or harrow a lot or use improved seed. It was kind of the frontier and the conservation models. But if now the scope is changing and the, the, the typologies are changing, then it is good because that is what I call now climate smart agriculture. That's what I teach. If now agroecology is being defined as a climate smart agriculture that allows precision. So that's what Charles is talking about. If the soils are deficient and you know what is deficient in, and initially you can use inorganic fertilizer to prop it up. And later on, there are materials on the shelves that I will not have to produce myself but I can just walk to a shop and bring in compost, walk to a shop and bring in materials to improve my 10 acres or my 100 acres. Then we have shifted the definition from what I need. The original definition, I didn't think if we were sticking to the original definition of the frontier or the conservation model, that didn't allow enough of improving soil fertility with even inorganic fertilizers using hybrid or genetically modified seeds. Doing things that will allow you not to fell too much trees, but at the same time contain the communities in terms of food production. Then I'm saying that then that can be used to feed the world, especially when we combine it with population control. But if we are not controlling population in a community, there is education that suggests that children should get out of the house and attend school and come back to feed without contributing to labor. And many of the people in the community themselves are literate. And by the way we train, People don't want to use their physical nature or to use their manual strategy to turn the soils 
when you are doing composting or to turn to, to use your strength to do everything on the farm, then that is okay for me. That is what I describe as climate smart agriculture. Because in smart agriculture, we are also encouraging organic materials. We are also encouraging energy efficient machinery use. We are also encouraging lifting water from elsewhere and not depending only on the rainfall and the rainfall cycles. We are also talking about knowledge, smartness, learning, receiving information through advisory services, say Meteo and all these things we are talking about. If this is the agroecology now, then I am going to say that it is possible that it will feed the world. But if it is the original pristine definition that says do not disturb nature, then I am not sure with our billions now, we can depend only on that. Let me, let, let me get a quick comment from Dr. Nyaba before I move on to Pacific in Rwanda. Dr. Nyaba, so then um, just to be sure, so are we seeing a situation where um, the definition of what exactly agroecology is has probably shifted from what it was in the 80s and the 70s compared to now? Have, 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 have the promoters of agroecology redefined what it means to include a lot of things beyond what it was 30, 40 years ago? Thank you, um, Ms. Opoku, Prof, and uh, my colleague, uh, Ben. I think somebody want me to introduce myself. Uh, I think you did, but I can see the chat uh, part. People are asking me to introduce myself. My name is Charles Nyaba. I'm a farmer and working with the Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana. Um, I cannot talk with certainty the definition of agroecology in the 70s and the 80s, because that time, I think I was not, uh, I was not into, I was, I was too young to do farming. But the kind of agroecology that I have studied and we are currently practicing as an organization is a type that is encouraging the farming to do their farming, respect the biodiversity, respect the environment, and at the same time, make money out of their farming activities. Because we have come to realize that the problem with the food, as we said, to feed the growing population is not necessarily about low productivity. As we speak, there were some occasions that we produce enough food in some part of the communities in Ghana. But the problem has to do with where to sell, how to distribute it to the urban areas and the towns. So the kind of agroecology we do is the one that is promoting farming practices that will increase farmers' productivity, that will protect the environment, that will reduce impact of farming activities on the climate. Um, now, if there was a definition before we started promoting our own, which uh, includes uh, non-scaling up farming activities or uh, combining agroecology with organic farming, I think it is not the type that we are trying to promote because the one we are promoting is the one that is protecting biodiversity, protecting the environment, and ensuring that farmers are still producing enough to feed themselves and for the market. Many thanks for that clarification there. Um, I'll move on to Pacific in um, Rwanda. Um, again, reading the paper that you published, Pacific, on saving Africa's agroecology food basket from the agroecology movement, you made the point that it's very wrong and a matter of social justice to use false claims about environmental concerns, indigenous seeds, and the preservation of Africa's food heritage to then block an entire population from accessing technologies that can save traditional crops and increase productivity. And then you go on to say, the activists are condemning one population to an endless cycle of poverty. Um, after listening to 
Dr. Charles Nyaba Ofa Wares, um, the broad scope of what exactly agroecology entails. Uh, is that a position you still stand by? Thank you, Joseph, and thanks to the plenary speakers who speak who spoke before me. But I think I'm really different from what they seem to promote when they talk about uh, agroecology. Because as a younger farmer and as a business person, I believe that agriculture needs modernization in tools and assets. When you talk assets, it's planet. Assets of agriculture, it's the planet. The climate change is affecting everyone. And when forum warm comes, there is no way that you go out and say that farmers should not use pesticides or uh, fertilizers. And we know that that's a reality of today. Uh, wherever you are, we are, whether you are in West Africa or East Africa, even in the US, they have foramium. It's not something that you can contain. There are pandemics like COVID. They are, they are infesting people's plantations like nothing happened. So when you talk about uh, limiting using of synthetic fertilizers or pesticides, you are totally putting uh, millions of Africans who are relying their daily bread from farming into endless poverty because there is no way I can produce enough if there is a pest like foramium or tuta absoluta killing our uh, our plantations. So that's where I really differ from the agroecology definition. And I believe that agroecology, it's a dead theory. Normally, if you today, someone believes that you can feed the African continent with agroecology, there is more things that you are trying to ignore uh, that the climate change, which is not uh, something that you can close your eyes when they speak about that. Many thanks, um, Pacific. So then uh, the other point then becomes, um, and, and I'll move to you, Mr. Ben agree on that bit. Um, <laughs> he makes the point that he thinks this is a move that may deepen poverty among farmers that will make it more difficult to deal with agricultural challenges like fall and and pests. Your reaction to that? Guri, I'm asking that Pacific, yes, yes, Pacific, yes, Mr. Guri, Pacific makes an argument that um, having uh, technologies like agroecology will deepen right, right, right. There will be difficult yeah. dealing with challenges like following UMPs. I can see Dr. Nyabe's hand is up on that, but yeah. how do you respond yeah. to such a concern? Yeah. Well, then I'll move on to Dr. Nyabe. Uh, yes, um, thank you so much. I think. Our position from uh, Prof. Ejir and Mr. Nassim are not very di di different. I think um, we are not against science. I think the agroecology movement is not saying that science is not important. What we are saying is that, and particularly from my point of view, there are two ways to, link, to think about agroecology. That's indigenous farming systems versus indigenous farming systems. The indigenous systems are what uh, from Nigeria has talked about. Where we do things the way our grandfathers did and that's that even with the challenges, we still want to do that. We are talking about a process where we are looking about the indigenous knowledge, but also look at good scientific practices that we can bring into it. So even, for example, if you take pesticides, we say we don't accept pesticides. But if you are in a, in a, in a pandemic situation, you should be able to use some specific chemicals to lock down, but not to take it as a practice and then you supply, use volumes of pesticides every day. So we are not too different from that. We are, we are not against science, but science from our own indigenous perspective, science that combines the knowledge of our people and the knowledge of the science that we're talking about. So we are not, agroecologists are not against science because Nassim give the impression that uh, agroecologists are anti-science and then we, 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 we don't think that uh, science can help us, but that is not a point. 
We believe in science, but how we use the science? The science has not come against our culture. The science must fit into promoting diversity and not killing diversity. That is the point. Um, Dr. Nyaba, you had your hand up on that, and uh, then I'll hear from Nasib as well briefly on that, so then I can move on to my next batch of questions. Yeah, um, I wanted to uh, give a quick response to my colleague who said that uh, given the increasing population, we cannot rely on the agroecology farming uh, when there is pandemic, when there is false summer when, and stuff like that. You see, with agroecology, you build your soil cover, you build the biomass. And with that, the soil remains fertile all year round. In that case, you don't need to apply fertilizer when the soil is already fertile. The call for heavy application of fertilizer is a current farming system that allows leaching and erosion. Mm -hmm. And every year we need to continue to use fertilizer. You talk of false armyworm. After or before the fall armyworm, we were not using those pesticides to control pests. So if there's fall armyworm and then we have organic pesticides, or even if you use the synthetic pesticides to control the worms, and the subsequent years, you, you are able to develop or come up with the natural enemies that control these worms. You don't need to continue to rely on the synthetic external inputs for your farming activities. So that's the point I just want to, to make. Very well. I will, I will move on to Nassif for his comments uh, as well in a while, because I'm, I'm getting very interesting reactions in the chat area. And um, Nassif, you could combine your comments with some of the reactions that are coming in. For example, there's a comment from um, Robert Waja, and he, he, he goes on to make the point, when I sat in the room and listened to several agroecology promoters in Nairobi in June 2019, it was very clear no pesticides were acceptable to them. This is not what the advocates are saying here. I am unsure which is the reality on the ground. Um, there are a number of other comments in the chat. I'll, I'll get onto that in a while. But Nasib, um, uh, your general comment on, on what mm -hmm. we've heard from um, Dr. Nyaba and Mr. Bernard Guri, you know. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Joseph. Uh, I should say my interest actually in agroecology stemmed from the very fact that I was seeing what was being promoted in the dominant model being out of touch with the reality of the farming that I was seeing farmers uh, do in, in, Uga in Uganda. And picking on from what Pacific said that, you know, you see all these challenges like fall armyworm and issues of like climate change. And you realize that we are dealing with very complex problems here. And the version of agroecology that I was seeing being promoted seemed to sort of push a very conservative uh, approach to how to solve these complex problems. And yet, as someone who was actually drawn to the science version of agroecology, I thought actually there is an opportunity here that this model, which is holistic and being sensitive to the, the farmer's you know, needs and putting the farmers at the center of the food system and taking care of whatever context of the farming that is happening. I was like, we need models like this where like, if for example, we have fall armyworm, and recently we had the locusts that just invaded uh, some parts of Kenya and northeastern parts of Uganda. These are places that are already you know, food insecure. And so these problems that are emerging and that continue to emerge call for like that complex thinking in terms of how we solve them. And the version of agroecology that I was seeing was not as complex. And I took an issue with that. And I am for a version that is sort of like holistic as agroecology calls for, so that it takes care of all the solutions we have in the toolbox to address uh, the problems that 
different farmers are facing in the different parts of Africa? Pacific, um, is this the same kind of model of agroecology that you've heard of in Rwanda as well? I think there is a misunderstanding about agroecology and its movement now, because no one, no, nobody would go against agroecology that it's being spoken here in on this platform. Because as you hear, well, it's like agroecology movement is really flexible to adapt to some new technological solutions, uh, including in uh, managing those uh, pandemics like foramiworm and uh, and other challenges farmers are facing today. But the challenge with the agroecology movement is that they are lobbying to even stop the use of other technologies. And if you are taking out uh, the technology, it means you are, it's a handicap to the population of Africa. Let, let, me, let me back again to the side of business. Um, I'm a business person. And when you look at the challenges we have in Africa, it's because we always get uh, food aid because we don't have enough. We are not producing enough ourselves. So that's number one. Secondly, uh, the biodiversity is really, really important if we are talking about saving agriculture's future. That's where I really like uh, the professor who shared about uh, climate smart agriculture. It's the new version that maybe those who still believe in agroecological uh, 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 interventions. Let's think about the climate smart agriculture where you need to know what your soil need, how do you manage your pest, and how are you going to manage the droughts that sometimes affect different parts of Africa. So the only way I believe that we can turn agriculture into a business, it into uh, making sure that we can produce but also respect our environment. But the challenge, maybe if you read uh, the, the paper I, I put out, was that the agroecological movement, we use terms like uh, indigenous food, indigenous uh, crops, indigenous, uh, everything will become indigenous. Like we want to exclude new uh, varieties that are coming. But if you go back, I'm not really old than the, I'm not the older person on this panel, but even the corn we eat today, it's not from Africa, it's from, uh, from America. It's here for many generations and the varieties my grandma has had are no longer responsive to, to, to today's uh, climate uh, situation which means we need to adapt, be it into new seeds that are resilient to the climate change, but also being able to educate our farmers that the agroecology we need, it's not the agroecology that doesn't accept uh, uh, ways that we can fight against these other challenges. So we need to take into account issues uh, of poverty that are really uh, mainstream in Africa and food insecure, people who are going hungry every night. So that's, uh, that's why I believe the agroecological movement is still um, like holding on on this uh, utopia uh, idea of producing without investing. We need to take our farmers to think about investing. If they don't invest in these technologies, there is no way they can survive for a minimum. There is no way they can survive droughts. There is no way they are going to survive uh, other pests and diseases that are going to come in the future because the world is developing. We've seen how the pandemics like COVID has affected us. If that, if we take that picture and apply it to the to the farmers, that's what happened when a new disease comes in, or that's what happened when a, a, a typical variety of crop is no longer responsive or adaptable to the climate conditions we are living in today. Very well. Um, thanks very much. Um, you know, listening to the explanations uh, and how um, Dr. Nyabai and Mr. Guri have defined agroecology and how it fits into the general conversation I'm, I'm, I'm listening to the conversation over the last 15 minutes or so, and I get a sense 
there is now virtually a middle ground that says um, agroecology, even as it's being promoted now, would involve the kind of phase that says uh, the integrated kind of approach, the climate smart kind of agriculture going forward, and the kind of agricultural production that says um, as and when other inputs are needed, go ahead and use it, but as much as possible, act in a way that preserves the environment as much as possible. I'll, I'll move on to Professor J, and then um, I will then move on to my uh, final batch of questions, then we'll, we'll get comments from, from the public. Uh, Professor J, do, do you get a sense that uh, why you spoke of as the climate smart kind of agriculture that actually goes uh, you know, to a certain extent in line with what we are being told today is the real definition of what agroecology is. Uh, when it comes to the kind of policy initiatives being rolled out across Africa, uh, do you get the sense it's falling within that domain and that it, it would eventually work out in terms of helping deal with the food security challenges we face? Yes, um, if you look at the CADEF itself, it's clear on sustainability for agriculture. Our own agenda for jobs in the last four years, and even align it with what we have called investing for food and jobs. The last major objective is sustainable land management of, and then the environment. So the policy makers themselves notice or recognize that it is important that we reduce emissions, degradation, and deforestation. So it is not only in agriculture that we are calling for agroecology. Actually, if you take our forestry policies, you will see that we are doing the red, the red plus, and all is towards making sure that yes, we will by all means destroy to build, but we will be careful in the destruction. And that, for me, runs through our Sustainable Development Goals, as I've said, our CADEF in West Africa, we have the ECOWAP in our own individual, and I've looked at um, Rwandan food policy, I've looked at Kenya, I've looked at um, even South Africa. Every state is cheering, making sure that we come back more into the kind of integrated approach, or now they call it the food systems approach, sustainable food systems approach. And all of them are taking all the three dimensions of sustainability together. You cannot just be environmental and look off or take your eye off economics, take your eye off social. And so the system now is ensuring that, yes, bringing the inputs that are not there, if it can improve some of the deficiencies in the soil, or it can improve some of the deficiencies in pest and disease management. Because let's ask Charles, he is a rice farmer. What is agroecology in terms of the pristine state in his rice farming? It cannot incorporate tree crops, for instance. Rice farming is not able to do that. It is able probably to incorporate organic materials or organic fertilizers mixed with the inorganic. When there are pests, probably you would do integrated pest management and therefore use pesticides as last resort. I have mango plantations and in the last four months, I've not been able to harvest fruits because of BBS. Am I saying that I am doing agroecology? So if there are effective or efficacious insecticides that can help me to manage very quickly and then be now introducing what is on the shelf called organic pesticides. I haven't seen much of organic pesticides. Even the organic fertilizers, some you have to do it yourself. And that is the problem I have. That if you are saying that let's do more of agroecology or more of organic, let the input market be there. Do not tell my auntie in the village to pound 
their own neem seed or to turn their own compost or to burn their own biochar. It is unfair. Women especially suffer for it. I am studying a group in the north. I've just come back from my northern Ghana, Boko. These women are supposed to prepare their own biochar and prepare their own compost. It is too labor intensive and low input. The much small tool they are even using to char is so, for me, a cake. So much heat, so much smoke. Okay. Is that what we are talking about? No, that is not what we should be talking about in 2021 for countries in Africa that we want to move forward. We don't yeah. want to import what some people have used science to produce in the US and in Europe, and then say that your community should stick to old fashioned ways of producing. But if you have shifted the definition to climate smart agriculture, then there is no debate. Thank you very much. Professor Edri, thank you very much. Um, th there are a lot of questions in the chat that I will get to in a while, but before I get to them, um, Mr. Guri, very briefly, in like a minute or less, mm -hmm. what do you envisage yeah. will be the consequence if the world doesn't turn to agroecology and continues on the path of industrial um, agriculture and agricultural intensification going forward? I I'll take your thoughts on that. Take Mr. Um, your best thoughts on that, and then you could then move on to all the questions in there. I think, I think the first thing is about loss of diversity. Because if you look at the way um, industrial agriculture goes, just like Prof just said, I think that we can't grow trees and rice plantation. But that 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 is not impossible. Because we have developed a methodology called a farmer managed natural regeneration, where and that's a traditional way of farming. Well, you allow the tree, trees to grow along with the crop. So if you are thinking of agroecology, just not as um, a, a, an economic term, but also as social, as she says, I think um, uh, uh, we have to look at it from, from that point. And uh, secondly, I, I think um, the idea of technology, as uh, one of my colleague speakers said, as I said, agroecology is not anti-technology. It is the way the technology is developed. We think that technology, our farmers also have technologies. Africa also has technologies. But how much is, is spent on our research for that? We know our researchers in the university are doing a lot of research on, on local seed, for example. They produce hundreds of, of, of seed varieties. But how much, how much support do they get? If they are getting support, it's from external people. And if they are, they are giving money from external, you have to do what they want to do, you know? And so if only a policy can actually support our local researchers to research into our local technologies, local seeds and those things, even as Prof said, I, organic pesticides, the challenge is yes, it's available, but it's not in, in, in quantities that you can go and buy off. So as part of our, uh, um, engagement. We want to see our farmers, want to see people who specialize in producing pesticides, agro-pesticides as a business, you know, and we believe that if government policy goes in this direction and supports people who start this, because if you start that business, first of all, they'll say you have to go and get uh, permission from a uh, uh, food, uh, food board, drugs and food board, in the process that an ordinary farmer has, some farmers have come to me they showed me examples of samples they've made where they say FDA, they can't get to its education. It's, it's just that it's not supportive of them. And so if government deliberately recognizes the value of agroecology and the value of our, 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 local, our local researchers and support, I believe agroecology is the way, you know. Um, I'll, yeah. I'll, um, I'll, I'll just get on to the tallest of questions that we have in the chat. Um, we are dedicating the next 30 minutes or so to questions from the attendees in the meeting. Um, I see a question from Kira Crowell. It, it's an interesting question. If Kira could unmute and possibly 
speak the question, I'll be glad. Otherwise, um, then I'll just quickly go ahead and read it. But I would really have loved that uh, Kira went ahead to unmute and then spoke out that question, which I get the sense is directed at Dr. Charles Nyaba. Kira, if, if, if you can hear me, go ahead and speak out your question so Dr. Charles Nyaba responds to it. Kira, can you hear me? Okay. Um, and so, Dr. Nyaba, this question from Kira Crowell is directed at you. And Kira writes, I'm struggling to see the middle road. It is one thing if agroecology accepts fertilizer to start the process of rebuilding the soil. But what about after that initial period? Isn't there um, still a disagreement between agroecology and non agroecology sustainability frameworks? in terms of fertilizer use after the initial period of rebuilding? Um, that's the question, pointing uh, as to what uh, Kira thinks. It's more like um, uh, something that's more difficult to understand. So what happens after the initial period of trying to rebuild the quality of the soil and then the, the, the soil quality goes bad again? Does agroecology allow you to go back to the use of synthetic fertilizers? Uh, thank you, Joseph and uh, Kira. Thank you for the question. Um, I wanted to add on before even the question that just like conventional agriculture is evolving and we keep getting new technology, I think in agroecology, we are not also against research in that area to ensure that we also improve what we do. Yes. In terms of um, uh, fertilizer, you see, we think that where there's no problem, we don't create problems. We apply fertilizer because the soils cannot support plant growth. So if you use the initial fertilizer application to build the soil mass, to ensure that you bring your dead soil back to life, and these soils are fertile enough to support plant growth, there is no need, personally, my position on agroecology is not the one that is ideological. I think it is the one that is flexible. But what I recognize is that we need to protect our, our biodiversity. We need to protect our agroecosystems. So any practices that we adopt that do not compromise the biodiversity and the agroecosystem I don't, I personally do not have any problem with that because uh, I have experience of young farming in the middle of Ghana. That is a brown half and then the Kiman area. These days, those who used to buy yam for export are rejecting yam from the Kiman because they're saying most of the farmers are using fertilizer. Now, those in Kintampo areas who are also getting equal quantity of yam without using fertilizer are gaining markets. And you realize that those around the human area are now moving to also producing yam without fertilizer. So to me, whether after you build your biomass, you choose to use the fertilizer, that is your business. But I think that if you are able to build your biomass, maintain your agro ecosystem, you yourself will agree with me that you don't need fertilizer. Let me give you one example, just shortly. If you go to Nkawe, uh, one of uh, our colleagues has been promoting agroecology, Kofi Bua. Today, you go there and almost all the farmers around that community are doing agroecology. Nobody is telling them to do. Because they went there, they studied what he's doing and realized that he's making more money with cost efficient uh, in terms of investing in inputs and other things. And most of them are doing it and they are doing far better than other farmers in other areas. So yeah. for us, that is our position. There's a question from Fred Behinga, and he's asking, um, are bioengineered crops gaining acceptance within the agroecology movement in instances where they minimize impact on the environment and contribute, sustainability, you know, co contribute to sustainability? As you made the point, it's, it's, it's evolving in terms of agroecology. Would we ever get to that point where maybe bioengineered crops, GMO technology could be accepted within the frame of um, agroecology, 
once it contributes to those targets of protecting the environment and protecting biodiversity. Mm -hmm. Do you want Hello. me to answer? Okay. Mr. Guri, you can go ahead and answer that briefly for me. Yeah, um, as I said, I think, um, you see, agroecology is about working with nature. It's not working against nature. So if that biotechnology is not about working at, about against nature and producing artificial things, it's acceptable. But most of the biotechnology is about, for example, GMO, it's about playing with genes in creating something else out of what we don't know. We don't know the long-term effects of those GMOs. And so those kind of things are still acceptable in, acceptable in agroecology. But if it's about a natural process and using biotechnology to improve a natural process, that is acceptable in agroecology. We are told that BT crops, for example, which are biotechnology crops, would Joseph, help reduce- can I say something? Uh, just um, a, a quick follow-up to Mr. Guri, and, and then I'll come to you, Pacific. Mm. Mr. Guri, mm. we are told that BT crops, for example, would help reduce the use of pesticides on farm fields mm -hmm. and, and cut down on mm -hmm. the use of pesticides. In, 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 in that sense, mm -hmm. that is something that agro um, agroecology would probably give room for, I guess. Yeah, anything that reduces the use of artificial uh, inputs is acceptable. Anything that accepts the use of artificial inputs. We work with nature, agroecology is about nature. Yeah. Yes, uh, I, want to, I wanted to comment on uh, Mr. Bernard. One of the reasons I think agroecological movement is really taking our population uh, uh, about the technology use is that passion about like uh, technologies like GMOs. Let me use an example. In Uganda, uh, they, they are research in agriculture, they developed um, banana that are resistant to fusarium. And they also developed other uh, biote biotechnological crops. And they those crops, they have some solutions that agroecological movement uh, frame doesn't accept because they are just GMOs. They don't even go ahead and listen maybe to, to some of the facts. For example, if you have a GMO banana, a banana is, uh, it, it, it is a much pride, like it's the same crop that you, you will have. You take one sucker and you make more, uh, more, 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 more seed drinks to, to give to farmers. And they don't, they, are, they don't even reproduce sexually, which means you, the, the crop that you have today, it will be the same, the, the same crop that we have even a hundred years after. This is the situation we have in Rwanda. Uh, Panama disease has taken down most of the indigenous banana crops that we had in Rwanda. And today, because the agroecological movement has put a stronghold on adopting these technologies, we are not accessing these technologies. And farmers uh, are losing, not only farmers, even the society, because if you, uh, you talk about indigenous food, my grandma grew grown up eating some varieties of bananas and we don't have them today because we are not really adapting technology that can help save those crops. With uh, biotechnology, you can save those crops that are going extinct today. So I, I don't see how you can accept to use fertilizer to build up the first batch of plantations that you have, then say that you don't want even them to be sold, those fertilizers, you don't want them to be sold on the market. Let's have a clear discussion here. We need to have the agroecology uh, frame accepting the fact that because we need these technologies, let's have them available in Africa. But today, it's, it, it's really, when you listen here, you think like they can even accept that this technology can be brought to Africa. No, they go outside and they say, they tell farmers, these are things that are going to kill you before we even have to test them. That's where the challenge comes. And that's mm -hmm. why it pushed me to even go out and speak 
for the farmers who don't really sometimes have this, these informations. Mm. Very well then. Uh, mm. Thank you very much. Very um, interesting position on, on, on the issue there. The number of comments mm. here. Um, Alima Sagito writes, there is evidence for successful agroecology practices, though in small numbers, it's a best practice and can be scaled up. Mm. Um, there's another comment here from Mark Kibo who writes, I think that this panel provides a very progressive conversation on agroecology. This is surely how to go. And this is from um, Mark uh, Kibo there. Um, a number of the comments of Michael Farrella writes that 600,000 farmers have switched to agroecological farming in AP state India. And then he goes on to share the link there. Um, there are a, a number of other comments here, um, also coming from um, other panelists. Well, there's a comment from Fred about bioengineered crops. Uh, Robert Waja writes, are two hill tractors not a very good thing to reduce labor while avoiding soil compaction? Uh, Robert Waja asks that. Um, Robert is again asked, uh, making a point that the 10 year IDDR report, which is an agroecological you know, report in Europe in 2050 found a 35% yield drop compared to conventional farming uh, in 2010. This agrees with many reports from around the world. How can agroecology deal with population increase uh, in Africa, which will be seen in the coming decade? So Robert is pointing to a report that makes the point about the likelihood that with agroecology, uh, yield will drop by up to 35 percent between 2010 and uh, 2050 and then he draws attention to the increasing population across the world and in Africa and asks how can agroecology then be used to deal with issues of um, food insecurity in Africa. Um, uh, there is another question here, a challenge to agroecologists, could you envision a way that biotechnology could be used to support climate smart agriculture. We've had quite a conversation on that. Um, Ankara Fanuye writes, I think the issue is drawing a balance. Our traditional system of farming is no longer productive due to population increase and climate change. However, modern agricultural systems must take into consideration the well-being of our environment. Uh, there's another comment here that there, is, um, there has to be an important nexus and more crucially, a balancing act between the planet and the people while we work towards creatively addressing food and income security in Africa. Uh, so then that's also the point there. Um, Clement Idunkunda writes, thank you for sharing an interesting topic. As Charles mentioned, agroecology should be environmentally friendly. However, science is applied. Um, that's and the number of others are the questions that are coming in. Stephen Wolf asked, uh, what are the key policy questions in relation to agroecology? What role can regional and national government play? And what are the appropriate roles of multilateral institutions? Uh, Professor J attempted answering a bit of that a while ago when she spoke about the CADEP um, policy for various African governments and all. And there's a question here, has modern agriculture ignored the soil microbiome and how could supporters of agricultural technological research help protect this aspect of agriculture? I don't know, Charles, if that's a question you can answer, but it's a question around whether modern agriculture has ignored soil microbiome and how could supporters of agricultural technology research help protect this aspect of agriculture? Um, we could get to that in a while, but um, another comment from Alima Sagito, agroecology is possible to feed the nation with the right policy direction, Alima writes. Um, William, William uh, Paliskani writes as well that uh, since its introduction in the US in the 50s and the USDA organic rules in 2000, organic agriculture is still grown on less than 2% of total agricultural acreage. I guess the follow-up question to that is even organic agriculture hasn't seen that widespread expansion in the US over the years. So has the guarantee that the story will be different when it comes to um, agroecology. Those are some of the 
uh, questions and comments that are coming in. Uh, Nasib, you've been listening in for a while now. Is there anything you want to touch on with the comments and uh, questions that have come in thus far? Uh, well, I would like to uh, chime in on the point that came up on bioengineered crops and whether they can fit within the agroecological framework. Uh, I'm afraid, you know, the, the current version we have right now being pushed down the continent, and I mean Africa here, is sort of conservative and not embracing of the advances in modern agriculture. And I would argue that there is an opportunity for agroecology to actually embrace some of these emerging uh, technologies. And the conversation should be how some of these emerging technologies can fit within the agroecological framework. For example, if what agroecology cares about today is to minimize the damage on the environment. What if I told you about a GM crop that has been engineered to reduce pesticide applications? If what agroecology cares about is farmers to choose what works for them in their farming system? What if I told you there is a farmer out there in Uganda who is interested in a virus resistant cassava variety and so far, the varieties we have right now that have more promising uh, results in terms of uh, being resistant to brown streak virus are genetically engineered. So this is the conversation I would like to hear, which is rooted in the contextual realities of what the farming is in Africa. And the dominant narrative you hear seems to be a direct importation from outside Africa by folks, whatever their motives are. And it's out of touch. We don't have industrial farming practices right now in Africa. If you're to call out industrial farming or conventional, you're calling out actually what you're calling agroecology. Because I could argue that more than 80% of the farmers are small scale, low input, low output, and we need to have a conversation on whether actually agroecology is not fighting a battle that doesn't exist in Africa. That is actually what I'm seeing, that they are fighting a battle of industrial farming. And I'm like, no, you're actually farming what you're promoting. Farmers are still under two acres. They are intercropping. They are you know, reliant on nature. I don't know of any single farmer who wakes up and wants to go and buy a fertilizer, nor do I know a farmer who wants to buy a hybrid seed unless there's a good reason for them to buy. It. That's my submission. Mm. That would actually take me to one of the other questions in the chat, which uh, maybe Dr. Nyaba could help us respond to. And um, this is again coming from Kira Crowell and Kira writes, what about the food sovereignty aspects of agroecology movement? How can farmers accept improved seeds, fertilizer and pesticides without continuing to be completely dependent on the market. Then Kira goes on to write, speaking of the market, how can farmers be food secure if they are dependent on the market and susceptible to the price volatilities of the market? So Kira is again drawing attention to um, the latest definition of agroecology as we've heard over the last hour and a half or so which we are again told seeks to promote food sovereignty as is being promoted by the agroecology movement. And is asking, how can agroecology farmers then be accepting improved seeds, be accepting fertilizers, be accepting pesticides without depending completely on the market and ensuring food sovereignty? Dr. Nyaba, um, the, the, the impression is being given there that there's some form of confusion in how agroecology is being defined as far as the, the conversation you've had over the last hour is concerned? Yeah, you know, the food sovereignty component of agroecology still goes to support my earlier definition of agroecology, that most of our soils are dead. So you need to bring these soils back to life. Now, after you are able to bring, to build your soil mass, 
and you bring them back to life. There is no need for you to depend on the market for inputs to increase production. For instance, you go to most of agroecology, our agroecology farming sites in Ghana, and we don't really buy any synthetic fertilizer, yet we are getting the same yields compared to those who are applying fertilizer. So in that case, we are dependent on what? The internal input from the farm, with our nestle have to depend on the market. Now, uh, I think there was a point to the effect that uh, most farming practices in Africa today is actually agroecology, and we are not able to feed ourselves. You know, there is one observation that I have made. Whilst we are investing so much within country, Africa, and global to promote conventional farming, bringing in different type of machineries for harvesting, for tilting the land, investing on inputs like GM uh, crops and what have you. Same has not been done for agroecology. So it is obvious that those who are against agroecology would make the point that agroecology is not profitable. But we need to ask ourselves the basic questions. Have we really invested so much into improving agroecology farming practices? We are first to identify agroecology farming practices with traditional farming. And that is the angle we are moving away from. Mm. That even those our smallholder farmers who are doing two, three acres, we try to introduce the concept of market. So with the concept of market, you don't just need to produce 10 different crops on the same acre and at the end of the day, you are not getting much to consume with your family and for the market. As I said, I had discussion with uh, one of uh, our trainees on agroecology before this meeting. And one of the new concepts we are looking at is that even the rice that Prof was talking earlier, you can practice agroecology farming on the rice farm even though I haven't done that for my rice and maize for now. What we do is that every 50 acres, you use trees to create the boundaries. So those trees will still accommodate other um, organisms like bears and other things in the environment and try to also produce enough um, oxygen that will promote um, the climate stability. You, 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 you get it. So within your 100 acres, if you have agroecology machineries, that will help you to do the planting with no till, uh, agroecology machinery that will allow you to do the harvesting. You can still have your rice, uh, uh, 50 acres of rice, you have another 50 acres of maize on the same piece of land using trees as boundaries to protect this uh, 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 crop. It is still no. agroecology. Once you are not depending solely on bringing internal input and dis disturbing the soil structure, we still consider that as agroecology. Many thanks, many thanks, Dr. Nab. I'll actually take that as your final word, and then I'll go ahead and take the final word from the rest of the panelists. Uh, Dr. Irene, uh, Professor Irene um, yeah, go ahead and- One key test of rice is beds, and you are introducing trees, how do you check this trade-off anyway? So I am happy that um, I have come to this forum to get the new definition of agroecology to be probably consistent with um, climate smart agriculture. And so um, that is my take home. And I would say that um, at least I know Ghana government does not stop anybody from meeting. If you think that um, you use practices that produce superior output, then niche, get the market, get your premium price, because um, I think um, Mr. Guri is speaking as if our foods should not be exported. In, in Ghana, we have communities that are expatriate and therefore, you have to produce such that everybody who lives in Ghana can also partake of our food. And that is why I don't agree that you should produce only things that your forefathers produced. 
if I want to eat pizza, Guri is saying I shouldn't because it is originally from Italy. I am not in agreement with that. 21st century Levin does not support that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Pacific, final words, keep it brief for me. Unmute, unmute. I think uh, one of the disagreement I have with the agroecologists on this panel is that they seem to say that we can import uh, chemical fertilizers to rebuild our farms, soil structure. Then after two or three seasons, we send them back where they come from because our farm will be immune from being degraded again. But as we know, as you produce on the farm, you are taking away nutrients from the soil. So you need a financially viable system to keep rebuilding your, your soil. So that's where the agroecology, I think, need to, to embrace the uh, adoption of African technologies, uh, uh, of the modern technologies into our farming uh, system in Africa. Many thanks, Pacific. Nasib, um, you have the last word, and then we are out of here. Uh, my last one is that we've seen that there are very many versions of agroecology. And my concern is that whatever the version we settle with, let it be a version that is inclusive of all the farmers contextual needs and aspirations. And it should not be exclusive of options that can be helpful to farmers agricultural needs. Thank you. Many thanks. Um, Professor Irene Jiri, many thanks to you. Dr. Charles Nyaba, many thanks to you. Pacific Nyashimana from Rwanda, many thanks to you as well. Uh, Bernard Guri from the court, uh, many thanks. He's left us already, but we thank him very much for his time. Um, I'm glad I am working out of this conversation with the key points that um, agroecology is not against science. It's not against technological innovation. Agroecology is very much progressive and what a lot of the campaigners like the African uh, Food Sovereignty Alliance are hoping for is pushing through that progressive kind of agroecology that could even possibly allow for, uh, allow for bioengineered crops going into the future as far as those conversations are concerned. And um, a comment from Robert Waja fits into that. Robert Waja says, I'm truly happy to see the agroecology panelists here being open to the use of GE crops, uh, including disease resistant crops, insect resistant crops, et cetera. I hope this narrative expands to agroecology as a whole, and then goes on to say the future of global agriculture is using the best of all types of agriculture. And um, a final comment I'll read before we go is coming from uh, Victoria Dongo of the Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana. Uh, Victoria writes, if policy direction could be shifted to promote agroecology, the argument of food security and farmers making money through agroecology would not arise. Um, Madam Adongo, thank you very much for participating in the conversation as well. And to all those of you who joined the conversation, including the folks from the uh, Dyson College um, at Cornell, uh, many thanks and have a good day. I hope you learned a thing or two from this particular conversation. Many thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye.